the quad core diode megatro teraflopper is now ready. I used to know a console cowboy. He worked for a dozen guys. One of them found out about it and beat him up so bad, he ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. Can I can I be honest, Daniel? What's up? I I cannot stop listening to the new Avenged Sevenfold album. Uh, I I've heard those tracks that you sent me. I, it's pretty good. I, I I've been planning on doing that. I might do that when I'm out running some errands uh, later today. Yeah, it's it's really enjoyable, and I I've just it's it's almost the only thing I've been listening to when I listen to music this week, and it's. I don't know. I feel like they made something really special, and it's it's really cool, and I love it, and it's great, and I really appreciate them going way out of their wheelhouse and doing something insanely crazy, and I love it. Yeah, the the tracks that you've sent me, um, I am maybe not your typical uh, Avenged Sevenfold enjoyer, but I don't know the tracks that you sent me were which were out of their wheelhouse. Uh, they I thought they did a really they were doing some really interesting stuff. I, I actually quite enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I appreciate when a band kind of tries to break the mold a little bit and do something different, because, I mean, you know, if they're making the same music uh, still after 20 years, I think that gets kind of old, and I like to see them use their, like, kind of flex their creativity in different ways, which I know not a lot of people feel the same way about their favorite bands, which I understand, but I do think that's a kind of closed-minded take, but... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of, do you like a thing, or do you like art? I'm going to I'm going to just put my flag down a little bit here uh, slightly on the on the side of snobbery. I I think I think that artists should be allowed to grow. Artists should be allowed to change. Artists should be allowed to, you know, continue to uh develop their sound or like follow their interests. And I I think it's really it's a shame that a lot of people don't feel that way and they they feel like an artist needs to be just one thing, the thing that they first heard and decide decide that that's what the artist should be for the rest of their life yeah my thought process is as long as they're making the music that they want to make i will give it an honest try and if i don't like it i don't like it whatever i still have their old stuff that i like that i can listen to but if i like it great that's just more to their catalog that i can add to my um my playlists and just listen to so uh, yeah as long as they're making the music they want to make as long as they're putting their passion into it that's that's what matters more to me. Whether that that matters more to me than whether I like it or not. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a very fair minded take. Yeah. Welcome to the Sad Boys Chord Book. All things music, all the time. My name's Dusty, and I'm Shreddy D. And today we're talking Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana, or Slamma Mamma Jamma. <laughs> I. All jokes aside, welcome to the Sad Boys Book Club. Uh, this is part two of Neuromancer. Yep. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I've been. How, how are you feeling about this book uh, the second time out? Um, I'm feeling like I'm ready to put the shortest episode of the of the book club in the books. Are you ready? Interesting. Sure. So things happened, which led to other things happening which resulted in more things happening, and now shit's going crazy. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you next week. All right. Thanks. Uh, no, I'm, I I don't know. This is a weird book for me. I think I, I, think I said similarly last time. I don't, it's, it's been, um, to pull the curtain back a little bit, it's been two weeks since we uh, recorded last because um, life uh, finds a way. And uh, I'm a little I'm a little hazy on some of the some of the things that uh, we talked about in that in that episode because I haven't edited it either because I'm a procrastinator. But um, so maybe I'd be I might be repeating myself a little bit this week. But it's a very weird book, and the weirdest thing about it is I'm more invested in it when I'm not reading it than when I am reading it, which is very strange. Almost like there there's a um, uh, 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 a gestational period after reading it to where everything kind of sinks in and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, this book's kind of cool, actually. I think it's really cool. 
Um, I think I think you know um, you can see a lot of the influence that it's given um, sci-fi and particularly the cyberpunk genre. I know that's probably a, an old hat thing to say, but it's just like if you've never read it before and you are reading it now, it's it's um, astonishing how contemporary it feels just because of how uh, how everything that's come after it has brought a little of its DNA forward. Yeah, reading the uh, the preface that uh, Gibson wrote in, in my copy of the book, where he was talking about how basically he was saying things like, well, yeah, I, I never anticipated things like cell phones, so there's a lot of anachronism in the, in the technology compared to what we're living in in, in our current... Um, our current reality and so with that i was expecting to find all of those um anachronisms while reading and maybe this is just my ability to um immerse myself in the world and have that um uh suspension of disbelief going that i'm not really picking up on anything that's really like sticking out to me and being like Something something like you would pick out in Back to the Future Part 2 with the flying cars in 2015 or Jaws 37 3D or uh, I, I know we talked about this last time too. I remember at least this bit. The, the Nike auto laces or the my favorite thing, my favorite thing, the rehydrating microwaves that make the that make the pizza. Like, oh, mom, you really know how to rehydrate a pizza. Like, you know, things like that, they stick out now because it's such a weird, like not quite utopian but like really uh not hopeful either um idealistic look at the future and, and even then it was like a it was a 30 year look into the future and I, I don't remember what year uh this book takes place in and if it's a similar i don't think they genre. really say i mean maybe maybe they did and i just blew past it but i don't feel like they said at any point when this book is taking place yeah, but I don't get that same sense of of feeling displaced in the timeline reading it as I would when I'm watching Back to the Future Part Two, which is such a it, nowadays it's it's an almost comical look at the future, and you know that's because of us having the uh, uh, the hindsight of looking back thirty years and being like, huh, that's not how things went, huh? So I I don't feel that way reading this. Oddly enough, uh, I can I can just look at the technology stated and think, yeah, that that fits the uh, the genre. It fits the era that he's establishing this world to be in, and I'm just kind of rolling with it. Yeah, I think part of it, it it's it's a couple of different things. It's um so uh, Back to the Future, as you as you mentioned, um, it is almost comical because it it itself. You know, it, it was a comedy. So I think part of that is intended to be a little bit uh, whimsical, at least. You know, oh, to kind sure. of give... Whereas this is a little bit more... Um, it's intended to be a bit more grounded. So I think that tone is is a, is another reason why it's a little bit... Uh, you know, it's, it's less tongue-in-cheek, so it's a little bit more... Um, you, you take it at face value and you just you just go with it. I, I should say I'm not at all by any means trying to compare Back to the Future to, to Neuromancer. It's just more so the just comparing the how how each of these take a look at what they think the future might be compared to how the future actually is for for us. Now I think I think it, what you you've stumbled on something actually very interesting is these different ways of depicting the future and you know and how how they feel you know some x years on i think i think there's uh, there's uh, definitely an interesting conversation to be had in, in in comparing the two and also because they came out roughly the same time period the the mid 80s you know yeah and if you, if you want to add another another um another piece to the pile of the um looking at the future and getting it a little wrong uh, i just had to google this to make sure uh, Blade Runner took place in 2019. Mm -hmm. And boy, uh, that that was another case of looking into the future. I uh, When did Blade Runner come out? Was it like 80, 84, 85? 
You know, I want to say 84. When did The Thing come out? Because it came out, they came out at basically, they were in the theater at the same time. So you could have had like the best double feature of all time. Yeah. Um, but all, all the same, it was, it was a, it was a look at. 1982. 1982. Okay. So it was 30, it was a 37 year look into the future. And then even with 2049, I think that came out in what, 2017? And that was uh, another 32 years. That sounds right. So even with Blade Runner, which was a look at about 30, 40 years into the future, and we're now four years removed from 2019, and it's you look at it, and most people, at least as far as I'm aware, most people who are at least older and aware of how um, some corporations kind of went down, the first thing you think is, Pan Am, huh? Okay. Yeah, Pan Am, Atari, um that, those those kind of things really stick out. Yeah. The the real lasting thing that Blade Runner absolutely got right is my boy Coca-Cola. <laughs> Welcome to the Coca-Cola the Coca-Cola minute here at Dusty to talk about his favorite beverage, Coca-Cola. That was not intended. That was just a happy accident that I stumbled into because that is one of the big things that you see in the opening sprawl of uh of Blade Runner is you have yeah the, um, it's, it's the geisha drinking the the Coca Cola yeah so everything goes back to Coca Cola Coca Cola runs the world we are all jacked into the Coca Cola Matrix don't take the red pill stay in your Coca Cola lives it's better here wouldn't Coca Cola be the red pill and Pepsi be the blue pill well no because the blue pill is what keeps you in the matrix the red pill is what opens your mind and frees you so yeah in terms of color schemes coca-cola is red and pepsi's blue but you want to stay in the coca-cola matrix so you take the blue pill god See, haven't you watched the matrix yeah i i actually saw it with you uh i think that didn't we see it at a theater uh like there was like a, a rerun of it or I don't know, but I hope so because I I never. I feel like when when we used to live pretty close to each other, uh, there was this movie theater near where we lived that would do repertory uh, film showings, and uh, you know I, I we saw some really good films like uh, Goodfellas, uh, Alien, and I want to say one of the later the last ones that we saw was um, was The Matrix. I think we also saw them. It was the same summer that we saw The Matrix and uh, here uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I, I if if I did, then that's great. I can't remember, which is unfortunate because I would love to see a movie like The Matrix on the big screen. Because uh, I first saw it when it was on pay per view back in '99. Uh, I was, I guess, I, I was too young to go to a rated R movie in the theater, so the next best thing was pay-per-view, and um, if you remember back in the day, I don't know if it still works this way, because I haven't watched a pay-per-view film since, I want to say, t 2003 with Return of the King, uh, or I guess that would have been 2004 when it came out on pay-per-view, and uh, I, I remember how pay-per-view at least used to work, as I remember it, it was, you would have the countdown timer to the show that you paid for, to the to the time slot that you paid for and it would have like a little it, it would have the the main screen it would have the countdown timer and on like the bottom right of the screen it would have this looping preview of the movie and i remember watching for like i don't know 15 20 minutes just on repeat the one for the matrix and it had um the the key scene that i remember is the the, the camera pan to neo on the on the the gatling gun on the helicopter and the slow motion bullets falling as he's firing into the building at the agents and i was just watching i'm like oh man i'm really excited for this movie and that was such a cool moment for kid me watching that movie for the first time in, in on pay-per-view in 1999 so that's my that's my memory of the matrix uh the the really the really uh middle to younger and zoomers cannot cannot comprehend how big a deal the matrix was how many lunch table conversations i had to sit through hearing about neo and trinity and the the merovingian or whatever like over the years like people do not people do not people today may forget how big a deal it was and um uh, to kind of but and and how um it's actually kind of interesting uh to kind of tie us back to neuromancer how 
aspects of Neuromancer influenced uh, the Matrix, including the term the Matrix. It's all connected. This was planned. But as as Dusty, I don't know. Did you did we talk about where we left off? Yeah. So okay. um, where we're where we're starting now is uh, Case getting the information about Armitage and his past and who he really is. So we we learn yeah. about uh, Screaming Fist and how he survived it. Kind of. That that's a word to use, but I don't know if it's the most accurate word to use. I guess in a certain sense he survived it. He survived I mean, his, it in his, body. His mind his mind didn't really survive it. And um in fact he that that's kind of the things that they talk about when they um when they uh, are reviewing this data, they see this video of uh of a uh, what what is his what is his actual name? Uh, Colonel. It's, it's a Corto Corto. something. Yeah, or something Cor- Colonel Corto. Corto. And uh, he he sees he sees the video of the guy and he, he kind of recognizes um, he recognizes him and they 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 learn that he was part of uh, Operation Screaming Fist, which was uh, essentially this sort of faint by the US military to attack Russia um, there was with the expectation that uh, that the attack would fail but they were essentially kind of testing out Russian defenses in terms of like not just their their uh, military hardware but the, I, the the whole purpose of the attack was to upload some sort of computer virus uh, to to the to the Russian interfaces i guess and um essentially it didn't it didn't work out so well like i think basically everybody died um i know i know we did talk a little we we mentioned that in passing um last time i don't know if we mentioned some of the details of of uh the, the mission itself but um corto he was one of the he was one of the main dudes there um they were they were flying in in some sort of like stealth craft some sort of stealth plane that was shot down um and uh, i think corto he managed to to get back to uh to get back to helsinki which i'm gonna i'm gonna pull an american moment here is is helsinki is in norway right oh man you are asking the wrong person but i am asking google it is in it's Finland. Finland. It's Finland. Okay. Uh, it'll uh, take actually, me 11 hours and 45 minutes to get there via plane. That's actually not that long. That yeah, compared for, to for how Finland. how far away how far away Finland feels. I think it's going to be quite a bit longer for you. I'd probably t- it's probably going to be somewhere in the ballpark of like 14 hours if I had to guess. Uh, yeah, it's probably probably true. Uh, but he he makes it to to Finland. Um. And he's he's in really bad shape. He's like he I know he lost his his legs and um, had significant damage to the rest of his body, and was basically um, pretty uh, mentally disturbed from from his uh, from from the uh, venture. So basically, they six million dollar ban him, and then they bring him back to uh, to Washington, where he he delivers some sort of testimony to Congress. And uh, the, the the that's where it kind of finds out that um, about about the whole the whole thing that this was this was actually just some scam and and that they were basically sent to die to go test all this stuff out and um, I think that's kind of a very um, I don't want to say naive but it is a very optimistic. Uh, portrayal that that it actually did create that it did have a that did represent a scandal in in the um in in the the story of the book like it was it, it the act the action was kind of scandal considered pretty scandalous and was covered up i guess it co- it would in our world to a certain extent but i just i i am uh, perpetually um surprised by people's ability to just 
completely overlook things. But that's neither here nor there. The next time uh, he he uh, we he appears, he's in in this uh, French hospital, and they diagnose him with schizophrenia. And uh, from there, they 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 do some uh, quote unquote experimental treatments, uh, experimental therapy, and then he kind of goes back underground. Um, and I think as we go along here, we are going to find out a little bit about. Perhaps what those uh, experimental therapy treatments entailed. Uh, but anyway, meanwhile, they, in their in their uh, their main story, they they get back. Um, the, after after they they've stolen the data, they're they're coming back to Istanbul, uh, which is where they, which is where, I guess they were planning to. They were doing the job. Um, they they arrive. Uh, with they they meet the Finn. Um and he's 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 there too and they're they're kind of uh they're like okay we're gonna have the meeting. Um they're they get this guy I I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. Do you remember how to pronounce that guy's name, the 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 Turkish guy they meet? Oh man, I know um Case was calling him uh something like uh Jersey Bastion or something like that. Yeah, that that was, that was like he was like, I imagine that was him kind of like making fun of the way he, because that's that's something that you'll see in this book that maybe one of the things that don't, um, that don't really that haven't really held up as well as like the the sort of like a, a little bit of a, it's not too too harsh, but there is like a little bit of making fun of uh, particularly people with different. Uh, accents that, the, that that maybe don't speak English and they kind of kind of joke on that a little bit. His anyway, his name is something like anyway. As I say this, I'm gonna just absolutely destroy this name, but I think it was like Terzi Bastian or something like that. Yeah, yeah it was like Terzi Bajan, maybe Terzi Bajan. Terzi Bajan. So we'll, we'll we'll go with that. Uh, apologies to all to all um, Turkish listeners here. And and people of good taste and pronunciation, but they 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 so they they meet him, and uh, they're trying to they try to get a little bit more information about the uh, the mission, and that basically Armitage is kind of like he he's playing he's still playing things very close to the vest. So even despite this very late juncture and the fact that they're kind of learning all these things about Armitage, Armitage continues to uh to play things pretty close to the vest um anyway after the uh, our, our our boy t essentially tells them that what they're they're here to do and they're here to to uh get this guy uh named uh riviera who has who has this like um how to describe him he's got like this He's got Strange. a holographic projector that he can use at will to seemingly create whatever he wants. Yes, a very, very realistic, as we are to understand, holographic projector that required him to lose one of his lungs. Yeah, like, that was weird. I remember th- that was a very strange... That was like like a extreme body modification. They had to like chop out one of his lungs to fit in this uh, projector module. Um, so anyway, the, the so Case and uh, the Finn and and, and uh, T they're they're taking the car and they're going they're they're kinda of giving a little bit of the backstory and then they're they're talking about how trying to get this guy and I think they're they're wanting to recruit him for their little uh, operation that they're going to pull here, and um, they're they're talking about how Riviera has has a taste much like Case did for for um, illicit substances, and I think they talk about Case makes a joke about him getting the same treatment where he has a pancreas that is no he's no longer able to metabolize um, the substances in a way that gives him pleasure that kind of to kind of like um, stop stop his addiction and I guess disincentivize the use 
Yeah, which the way that he, um, because he he, he does it, um, I guess as Riviera sees it, a more pure and natural way, Um, because Case does it, he he says he does it through derma, which is like through the skin, and um, I get, I, I, I'm assuming it's like just patches that you put, you put on your skin, and that's how you do it, you know. Uh, though, Riviera seems to make a show of it. He uses a needle and some sort of membrane that makes it to where the ne- It doesn't matter if the needle's dirty; it won't affect him. Which that's a very convenient technology for drug users. But like the way he does it is he has this hologram. He like he makes the um the tube that he uses to um to cut the circulation and pop the vein out he has it as a snake and has the needle as a scorpion and we see it as the scorpion stinging him and then when the illusion goes away we see that it's actually the needle that he's injecting and i i love the little bit that case has where he's like you always have to make a show of it and he's just like yes i do ha 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 and it's like this guy's kind of a clown he really is. He he's as we'll see later, is a pretty gross guy. Um, oh, the, the, another thing that they me- I, I me- might mention here is just a little bit of world building. They talk about uh, they they go they they're going through the market. They're 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 still on the hunt for Riviera, and they see this taxidermied horse. And uh, they they mention in passing that that Case has never seen one before, and. Um, and and uh, I see. I think it was the Finn that mentions that he he'd seen one in in like a like a museum in Maryland or something like that, and it was saying that scientists in the Middle East have been trying to uh, use the ho- horse DNA to try to reintroduce them back into the world. So it's this is kind of a, an interesting trope that you see in a lot of like cyberpunk things. For example, the uh, game Cyberpunk. Is like this idea of like a, a post natural world um, where where you see a lot of like um, is the word ecosystemic a thing? I don't know, but I, I'm just gonna say like ma- like like mass extinction in, in so such that you know basically animals or a good chunk of animals no longer exist. Yeah, which. I, it makes me kind of wonder if the world would even be sustainable at that point. Just kind of seeing at least how things work in our in our world. And uh, thinking about if ecosystems as a whole completely collapsed, if we would even be sustainable at that point. I don't know. Maybe maybe they, they, uh, they eat... Well, they talk about eating cloned tissue, don't they? Yeah, I mean more than just like with food. I mean with with the environment and uh, yeah. the the atmosphere and, and everything that relies on nature more than just animals, but like you know, all of the flora and fauna. That's fair. That's fair. That's a that's a better way to look at it anyway. Um. Yeah. So when they 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 have this whole elaborate plan on how they get Riviera, which it seems a little overprepared for lack of a better word like they have this I, it's like all the lights go out and like a spotlight shines on them and they have molly there ready to pounce on him because she's i guess been tailing him and then he yeah, does she was like following him on the rooftops wasn't she yeah yeah uh something like that and and he does this big old thing where he collapses as soon as the light hits him and he creates this projection of this really disgusting mechanical non-human like fleshy creature and i don't really know what exactly goes down next because like we have the um uh they, we have the uh the uh terzy bijan rush him and he goes through the hologram and there's like muzzle flashes I don't know who was shooting. And then next thing we know, he's sitting on the ground and he's lost most of his middle finger. And Molly's just like, you're an idiot. I had this covered. And they have Riviera. And 
what happened? Like, what? <laughs> so, is it possible that, that like, Molly... Because she has that weird gun thing. The Fletcher. The Fletcher. Um, maybe she, like, shot his finger off or something. I don't know. Yeah, so they get him. And uh, now the plan is... Um, they have to go to space? Is that right? Like, it's it's like a colony in space, or at the very least in the upper atmosphere? That is a thing, but I need to... I think... Let me look Am up... Am I jumping a, ahead? A... Is it, So, is it Freeside, or is it Zion? Like, what, it, is, are they two of the same thing? Like, Zion is, like, the the group of people that live in Freeside? Is that... Am I, I think Zion is, the, is, is where they... The... The, the Rastafarian guys are, are living. And that's like a portion of Freeside? I think it's its own thing, and then Freeside is a different place. Because they, they like go go from, like, use a, sh- a craft to get from there to get to the other place. Yeah, they keep talking about, like, a tugboat. The next part that I'm seeing is, okay, I see where, uh, where T has lost his middle finger, and the fin, and, okay... The Finn had and a hired hand transport Revere to the hotel where Case and Molly are staying. Um, okay, yeah, this is Molly at chewing him out. Let's see. Molly and Case go to the museum. Okay, yeah, th- here's this. This is something we should talk about then, because it's, it's talking about how Case begins to tell her about Armitage's true identity. Oh yeah, in. Oh yeah, yeah, because then there's the the, the phone call. From uh, Winter Mute, Winter Mule. Oh yeah, that that was that was actually a really cool moment. So anyway, after after uh, after uh, ter- after T takes off, uh, Molly and Case they they uh, drive to a museum, and they're kind of like looking around, and it's, it's this moment where Case uh, tells her a little bit about um, Armitage's true identity, and. Um, they they kind of they're talking a little bit and they kind of are are thinking like they're wondering to to what extent is Armitage like a does he remember all of the things that happened to him does he know that he was Corto or is it uh, or is he like some sort of uh, fully construction of Wintermute um, that that doesn't really have any sort of um, that is basically just a puppet, I guess, of Wintermute, rather than any sort of uh, uh, fully fleshed person of his own right, I suppose. Um, and uh, I think they talk a little bit about um, Molly's observations of Armitage, that he's just... Uh, talks talks about how he's always like staring at the wall and really only moving and uh, be- being active... When he's he's doing something to further this sort of uh, winter mute job, yeah, he's almost like a robot, which is kind of funny. Like he's just sitting there staring at the wall, and then it's like something clicks, and he's like, "We must continue on." Yeah, and I I think it's it's fair. Like based on that, it may, I, I am I am of the opinion that he Armitage exists more as like a shell, as like a um, almost like a and like a, a meat space interface for the purposes of Wintermute. Well, we do kind of get a confirmation of that later on with his conversations with Wintermute. Uh, that's true. I'm I'm jumping uh, ahead as I do. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. And and some of this stuff, I I I I, for, I remember like we we had a little bit of a hiatus, so some of my memories are stronger than others for other for whatever reason. And uh, let's see. So, so they they talk about um, they also talk about Riviera, and they basically they decide that um, he's they talk about how he's really bad. Um, he's Molly describes him as a compulsive Judas, um, and that he can't get off sexually unless he knows he's betraying the object of desire. Um, so basically, you know, cl- class A scumbag here, and. Uh, 
they they uh, I think they went they go back and they get some they they buy some things for Rivier like some sort of substances because I got to keep I him uh, got to keep him hopped up. He yeah you, you, in in a lot of cyberpunk um, literature I've and uh, books and games and whatnot I the 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 use of drugs is is like a pretty common um, theme that runs through and I think the the idea of addiction and. I think that's kind of that's an interesting thing that I, I think we you know maybe a little bit later when we have more time we can uh, we can discuss you know how the tra- trace the through line of the, this idea of addiction and compulsion being this uh, motivator through the through the, the plot here. Um, but back at the hotel, uh, they he he talks to uh, he talks to Armitage and Armitage tells him he needs to go. To a place called Freeside, um, which uh, is a space colony uh, that's that basically orbits the planet, um, and it, it's got a little bit of you know it's got some some big um, I guess installations. These places that that we we will uh, we will see as the the plot moves along. There's there's a lot of different like sublocations there. And what and, we uh, see, it, it seems like a lot of it is nicer than than places on Earth. Yeah, uh, that, and that's that's another thing I've noticed in, in a lot of these um, cyberpunk stories is like the the you know, as the the dying biosphere and and like the um, the uh, the the rebirth of of humanity in these like sterile space bound environments. Um, as anyway, as he's leaving. There's like this, there's this really interesting moment where, where he's walking by and he's he's trying to leave the hotel, and as he's walking, the payphones uh, start ringing, and uh, he, he ignores it and he moves, and as he's moving, the subsequent payphones ring as well. Well, uh, so before that though, the the first one rings and he answers it. And it's Winter Mute, and he's like, "We need to talk." And then Case hangs up. And as he's leaving, as he's passing each payphone, it rings one time. Oh, that that one was re- that was a really cool moment. Um, yeah, I could. That was a really great was, visualizer moment. That was like that. Was, that was very very creepy. Um, I would. I I don't know. I I've I've heard that they're wanting to. Um, Apple TV of all people are trying to. Um, they're trying to adapt this for their their uh, their streaming service that is currently only watched by like um, very passionate NPR listeners or the the a certain a certain kind of people. Uh, they and they don't really. I don't know. I don't. I'm. I'd be interesting to see how. I don't know how how that that plays out because in my mind when I picture it. It's really cool, and you get like the dim lighting of like the, the foyer, and it's mostly em- it's basically empty, and I don't know. It's it's just it's such a cool moment. Yeah. So now they're they're heading to uh, Freeside. They're they're in they're in space, and uh, there's this interesting um, symptom that can happen to people similar to um, altitude sickness or um you know any, any emotion sickness or things that you could get while flying on a plane but this is called space adaptation syndrome and it's it's like something to do with your heart rate increasing and it like really messes with you uh and case is acting all cool like oh no it's fine i don't get motion sick and then she's like molly's like yeah well uh sas is uh not fun and here's what happens and case is like it happened and it was worse. So we have this like this this interesting little uh, syndrome that can happen to people. But first, they have to go to this colony called Zion, which was built by uh, was it three men that decided that they don't want to live in Freeside. So screw that noise. We're gonna build our own colony, and then they did. And it is a very uh, is it is it fair to call it a very Rastafarian colony? Is that a fair way to describe it? I I, I think well, I think that that is like the, the what we are supposed to be taking away from it because a lot of the um, 
the the references, for example, the place being called Zion, uh, referring to the outer, you know, the world, um, particularly the Western powers as Babylon and all those things are are, are trappings of of a uh, I would say like like seventies and eighties like reggae and Rastafarian culture, which is where this grew out of. So I, I think it, it that is that is supposed to be our takeaway is like that these. The, the 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 people that live in Zion, um, which by the way is seems to be relatively like relative to the rest of the 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 world, maybe not like as like fancy or nice, but like the people are a lot more normal there than basically everywhere else. They, it's it's uh, I don't know. Anyway, so they they are at least normal relative to how we would say, because it feels like they're a little bit more. Um, I guess self-effacing, like they're they're like willing to they're they're a little bit more community-minded, whereas most other places that we see are all very like based on hierarchy and kind of corporate, like, corporatism and like this sort of like ultra-capitalist mindset. Yeah, which uh, who who are the guys we meet? It's um like Errol and Malcolm. Is that their names? Errol, Errol, Malcolm, and there was one other guy. He was like the one of the the original um. The original founders. Yeah, they, they didn't... All they called him was, like, the man from L.A. when they talked to him. And then the other guy was just called the other guy. Or, like, the other man. And I, I love that they're they're talking... Uh, this is a little later on. They, they, they get to Zion. And uh, it's kind of like a stopping point on the way to Freeside, which is the main space station where they're going to be doing their their big hit against... Um, what's it called? Star Starlight? Stray, Stray Light. Stray Light. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna infiltrate the, the stray light for the, we'll, we'll learn later what exactly they're doing with that, and, uh, yeah, it's like a stop on the way, and they're supposed to, I guess, get some people that are going to be, uh, just other, just members of the crew, so to say, that they're picking up in, in, in Zion, and Case and Molly are taken in the night, the quote-unquote night, to meet with the uh the leaders of zion so to say and um it, it's like two of the guys that built it that are still alive and one of them is talking i don't want to say like like normal relative to case and he questions it and the guy's like well i'm from la and then you have the other dude who is um speaking in a more rastafarian accent like the other men on on zion and I, I just love how it's when you're when you're reading it, it's the man from LA and the other man, and you can you can always tell who's talking because of just the, their their mannerisms and their speech. And I I thought that was uh, not necessarily funny scene, but it I, it kind of just got a little chuckle out of me. Just the oh um you don't have an accent like them. Well well yeah I'm from LA. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of an interesting thing, and it, it kind of shows like this idea of. Um... You know, like I said, there may be moments of like uh, relative insensitivity in this in this novel, um, but I thought that was an interesting way, like uh, an an uh, a way to uh, what is it called? Not invert, but like to to sort of like defy the the expectation. Like uh, that case develops. He's like, oh well, they're all such and they're all one way, and then they you know he runs into someone that to him, as you say, is. is is uh, more more is is I don't know he's just different you know yeah yeah they're they're in Zion just to kind of get acclimated and so so that case will be ready when they get to Freeside to just kind of move as they need to because they I guess they have they have to work somewhat fast they have they have they're on a somewhat strict timeline and um, so they. They're they're there and then now they're moving on to Freeside. Um, I'm not missing anything important, am I? Um, With moving on to Freeside now, I'm just looking through here. I don't I don't think I don't think there's really too much. I think that's that's really important. Yeah. So we we get kind of the idea of what the general plan is and why Riviera is there because Riviera is supposed to ingratiate himself with. Um, Oh, what's her name? It's like uh, Jean three, uh, or or three is, th- three is Jean three 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 Jean. I think is how how I've seen it. 
Yeah, I I forgot. It's like is it it's like is it like three John Jules Verne or was the Jules Verne something else? Rue, Rue Jules Verne was this the name of the street. Okay. The, the, okay. Yeah. Um yeah, Molly has to um Ah, uh, jeez. What, what, what's her part of the plan? She has to, um... I can't remember what her part of the plan is. She has to, she has to infiltrate uh, the stray light. Yeah, I can't remember exactly what, what Armitage said. It, I don't think it's super, super important to get into the weeds about with him saying, alright, when we get there, you do this, you do this, you do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, so, something I forgot to mention. When, when they were talking to the to the the two old men that built uh zion uh they mention how the things that they're doing and like the things that they've seen are like something that's pointing towards the end times and that molly is a representation of of someone who's going to bring about the fall of babylon or something like that it was um the see they're calling her the it's like something like the steppen razor yeah that that's right yeah, so they, they make it to Freeside, and now it's like, okay, now we need to, to start doing our, our kind of blending in plan. And I, there's, I, there's this great little scene where, um, I think this is the second day they're there, or maybe like a little deep into the first day, where Molly says that uh, Case needs to blend in, so to say, by giving him some bronzer. And she, oh, yeah, that was funny. Yeah, she essentially paints his entire body in bronzer, but she runs out uh, with uh, only his foot left unbronzed. So he's this just fake tan-looking dude with a plaster white foot. <laughs> I, 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 got, I got a good little chuckle out of that. Uh, that, was a, that was a fun little scene of, uh, of, a, of another character moment between Case and Molly. But, uh, yeah, they're there, and... Um, they're just kind of like. It seems like they're just kind of like, trying to, get into the general like kind of they kind of blend in, and just kind of, place themselves inside of general freeside life while they kind of prepare, because there's some sort of, uh, not necessarily an event, but the the whole point of what Riviera is there for is going to be something that's coming up in a in a few nights uh, and a, a a little like thing that he is going to be um uh performing at one of the restaurants that they're at but yeah. um yeah in that time uh uh case is um he he get, he gets he jacks in, he's jacking into the the flat line a lot uh, at this point and he's talking to um uh to McCoy and uh they're talking about um the times that uh, he flatlined because uh, one if you remember one of the things about McCoy is that he um, he was bragging about how he flatlined three times and he tells him the story of because uh, case asks him if he's ever tried to hack an AI and he's like yeah that was the first time I flatlined and uh, he tells him the story of kind of like he goes and he tries it, it looked like this big white cube and when he tried to touch it, the next thing he knew was his his roommate or whatever was taking the um the headband off and uh, the smell of like burned flesh and he had been flatlining for like 40 seconds or something like that mm -hmm. and that was like that that was the first time so we get this idea of you know a you don't you don't want to mess with ai that is how um that is supposedly how you quote unquote died those couple or how how he died those couple of times or at least the first time and that comes into play pretty soon afterwards. I'll get to that in just a bit. Um, but uh, you know, they get, we get some more information uh, about um, Tessier Ashpool and how um, there's they, they have their fingers in a lot of pots, it looks like. And um, that Wintermute is not just a... Um, or, or that uh, Wintermute isn't the only thing that, that TA might have in the realm of AI, and this is confirmed a little later on. Um, so, uh... <sighs> so, together, the two of them, they're running through uh, the Matrix, and they find the AI, they find the cube, 
and uh, Case wants to investigate it, and as soon as they get close to it, it creates this gray sphere that goes around it and just expands out like a like a shock wave. And Case gets hit by it before he can jack out, and then we get um, our first real uh, conversation, our first scene with Case and Wintermute. And this, I, I thought this scene was really cool. Uh, I really liked how kind of jarring it was. Because it, it almost feels like we're jumping back into a flashback. Because he gets he gets hit by the gray uh, wave that expands out. And then suddenly he's back on uh, on Nimsei. Or Nin Ninsei. And um, I, I thought at first it was a flashback. And it was just him kind of like having this dream of a memory. And then he was going to wake back up. And it would have been like, yo, yo, man, what's going on? You were You were all messed up. But no, it, it's 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 all this big manipulation uh, by Wintermute, and it's I I don't know I thought this this scene was really cool. If if you wanna if you wanna take this, uh, I I really like this this interaction. Sure. So, K as Dusty mentions, uh, Case finds himself or seems to find himself in the arcade. And um, he sees Linda Lee playing one of one of the games that he always used to see her playing down at the arcade. And um, you know, he uh, he he talks to her a little bit, and and uh, you know, she's you know they they he's trying to remember when was the last time he seen her, and um, he can't remember. He he just remembers kind of blacking out and uh, waking up in an alley, and that's that's really all that he he can remember. And uh, so they talk a little bit, and um, Linda offers to, you know, to to take him back home. And uh, that's when things start to get a little bit strange. Um, the uh, the the arcade starts to sort of like warp, right? It starts to like crack the and and like vibrate, and then it kind of like starts to dissipate. You know, as it, it, it's it, which is this very interesting moment. If you could imagine, like this, this very vivid and realized world around you start to like distort, and um, he, so he, and, and then I think that's that's the point where where Linda Lee, you know, she, I think she kind of disappears too, and um, he he steps outside of the the rapidly like derealizing. Um, Arcade, and he finds this pack of cigarettes um, on the ground, and he he looks at it. It says Julius Dean Import Export, and that's kind of when he's starting to put together this concept of like um, that th that he is not that this is some sort of it's not like a memory that this is some sort of like weird um, state that he's in, and that's that's when he. So he goes down. I don't know that that. So that's just kind of him putting together this this strange world around him. And uh, so he goes down and he he goes to Dean's office, and uh, he he gets in. The door is the door is open, and he sees on uh, Dean Dean's gun on his desk. And uh, he looks at it. He's he's he knows that the world around him is maybe not quite what it seems. So he kind of like tests it, and he like shoots a hole in the desk and uh so but and that's when dean steps out of the shadows and he, he talks to him and he's like tells him that to not shoot him and um he because in the matrix it's it's it, it's it's kind of a pain to die even in the matrix because you know in the in the matrix it still takes you it still takes you time to uh to to sort of regenerate i suppose and then, so the, so uh, Wintermute, who is speaking through Dean, the or I guess the sort of like Dean-like construct, he's talking to to um, to Case, and he's he explains that the reason that he's in Ninsei and you know thinking about Linda, is that like all of this, you know, he's trying to to communicate with Case in in a way that he understands. So he's he's appearing to him through this. Um, through these memories of, of Linda and of of his life, and uh, that that uh, the the reason you know the one of the things that the reasons that it's 
things have gotten kind of weird there is because his, his he's a little bit too um, emotionally charged when he thinks about Linda. And so you know they talk they talk to Case, and he's and, and, and we get a little bit of what Wintermute is, and he's you know he, he talks about how he has been really the one pulling the sh- this is the confirmation we we have we've kind of suspected, but this is Wintermute you know coming out and being explicit and saying that he's been the one that's been re- uh, arranging things for Armitage, and. Um, he he talks about the he kind of like we get a little bit of the lowdown on like what what Wintermute is and like the the um what this job is all about. He likens himself to like like um a patient that has had um I don't know what is the what, I know so in some extreme cases like they they have to like rule, will either like remove like lobes of your brain or parts of your brain. He, he kind of likens himself to his being something like that. And that um, the other part of the, the lobe that makes up the, the totality of the Wintermute AI is, is in a different facility in, uh, I think, Rio de Janeiro. So, that, that, that's a, at that point, so Winter, Wintermute is talking about, like, he, he he then even though he talked about the the, the strings he, he talks a little bit about um stre- screaming fist and and all of the the um he elaborates a little bit more on armitage and he explains that he is um he's basically armitage is is uh kind of he's he's an ai program almost that's running over like this this traumatized man and that it's not really, it's it's not going to last forever. Like they, that's I think that's one of the reasons why they have to move quickly is that Armitage, this interface that uh, Wintermute can have with uh, the world of humans, um, is not really stable because of you know his extreme the extreme trauma that he's suffered, and so that that's so that that's part of the reason I think why that there's this impetus to move quickly on this mission. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else. I, I, I that anyway. That's this point. Um, Case is obviously, as as one would expect, pretty horrified by all this. Uh, that he's being manipulated. That that uh, Armitage is just like this creepy meat puppet for this AI, and he's he's pretty much done with the conversation. So he he just he blasts. Uh, Dean the, or or the the construct that looks like Dean in the head, and that that basically ends the simulation. Um, so after this simulated world slash memory uh, ends, Case is back. He he wakes back up, and he's um, this is something that we didn't mention before. But uh, while while they're doing this mission, Case is riding in a um, he's riding with with Mal- Malcolm. In, in this uh, craft that is known as the Garvey, named after the, um, you know, after the after the, uh, the civil rights figure Marcus Garvey. So they they talk about and he hears uh, Molly and and uh, Malcolm talking about him, and uh, they t- they mention that uh, Case has flatlined for forty seconds, um, which is. Th- just that's basically the same uh, same length of time that that um, Dixie had flatlined, wasn't it? It was something like that. Uh, I, I I feel like I remember uh, him saying that he had for that long, but maybe that's me just subplanting that information into it. But I feel like I remember reading that it was forty seconds for one of his two. Yeah. So I either either way, whether they've both done forty seconds, it's like this. It's it still represents this moment of like the the convergence of Case, and um, and Dixie and like he's he's kind of it just goes to further this idea of him following through, uh, Dixie's uh, footsteps. Yeah. So now they're um, yeah they're they're on Freeside and they uh, 
like uh, Kate Case has a, a, a bit of a suspicion because he thinks that he thinks that Dean killed Linda back in the in the fighting pits, and he's suspecting that uh, uh, Wintermute might have something to do with it. And uh, he has this dream uh, about a memory where, when he was fifteen, he was uh, he was living in a hotel with this girl named Marlene, and uh, there was a um, a wasp nest that was formed. Uh, it was like what like outside on like their patio or something. And she asks him to take care of it, and. I, I, I don't know why they had easy access to something. This, this was like, I guess, her her boyfriend, her biker boyfriend's uh, flamethrower. And so he, he he hits it with the flamethrower, but all it does is cause, is cause it to fall down to the ground below. And so he goes down to, um, to finish the job, and it's broken open, and he sees uh, burned wasps writhing, and then also inside the nest is he's seeing all the different stages from uh from like egg to larvae to wasp and it it it, he uh, he likens it to some sort of like microcosm of the world or something like how this is kind of a a symbolization of of like humanity in the world or something like that and uh he tries to burn it again but he does the process wrong this time and it creates a uh, a fireball that singes his eyebrow and then uh, he wakes up, but then he remembers that uh, uh, he realizes in the dream when he was looking at the uh, the wasp nest, uh, it's almost like the wasps uh, chiseled in uh, the the TA logo, which is interesting to say the least. And uh, yeah, so like the next day, they're just kind of doing things. We get another scene with uh, with Molly and Riviera uh, that makes. Riviera look like more of an asshole and Molly just having more and more growing contempt for him. Uh, but then uh, Case goes to the uh, to the Garvey and he gets this virus. Uh, as the, I really hope I'm saying this right. I apologize to anybody who might have um, any uh, Chinese heritage if I'm saying this wrong. Uh, the the Quang Great... Uh, Qu- Quang? It, it's K-U-A-N-G. Uh, the Quang Great Mark 11. And it's the virus that they're that he's supposed to use to break through, the uh, the TA firewall to let them get to, essentially free, um, the winter mute. And he uh, he asks uh, he uh, he Jackson the flatline and asks uh, McCoy about it, and uh, he he plugs it in and allows him to to kind of work with the virus, and then he just kind of goes on about his merry way and back at the hotel he's case is like he's jonesing hard he's like i want to get high so he meets this girl named kath up on the roof pool and she thinks he's a gangster but he responds saying he's just a drug addict and uh she offers him some drugs so he goes and meets her um her boyfriend bruce or i'm assuming boyfriend I think he's referred to as her partner, uh, and they also kind of look like twins because of, like, I guess, some work that they got done. Hmm. And they, uh, Bruce is basically just like, like K- Case tells him his story. Um, also, I don't know how relevant this is, but Case gives the pseudonym Lupus. Um. So Bruce tells him, isn't isn't Lupus some sort of some sort of like very deadly disease? Um. Well, not on house. It wasn't. I, 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 I probably there. There was. There is something called lupus. I don't. Know. I was just because if there's like some sort of like if I, I I don't know what that is, but maybe there's like a, some sort of symbolism there, potentially. Yeah. If it is that it went above my head because I'm definitely not. I I'm not super knowledgeable when it comes to the medical science, but. Yeah, I, uh, he's talking to Bruce, and he tells him the situation with, like, his pancreas and how the surgery that Armitage got him basically stops him from being able to... His, his his body just doesn't process the drugs. And Bruce is like, well, I'll tell you what. If I have something that doesn't get you high, it's on me. And we have this nice cut back to uh, him coming back to the hotel room to Molly, and she's just like, holy shit, you're high. And he's like... Yes, I am. And she's just like, 
That's, if you got something that was that strong enough to get through, uh, you're going to have a real bad time tomorrow. And he's like, I don't care. I have an erection. And then they have sex. Yeah, that, that, that is kind of how their um, their relationship basically is. You know, it's it's a very... Um, it's not a particularly uh, warm one. It's, it's It seems a lot more geared towards, um, you know, sexual gratification. Yeah. Uh, so the the next bit we get is, the, this is this is the big dinner that Riviera has been working up to, Armitage and Riviera, and this is the um, uh, the scene that is supposed to ingratiate him with um, uh, Lady Three Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool. Um, that's her name. Uh, what a name. Her name is, it's, it, it's not, it's not like three Jane, like some weird kind of spelling of three and Jane. It is the number three and then the word Jane in, in all in one word. Very strange. I don't understand these people of the future and how they name their people, but, um, all right then. And, it's, uh, it's like an Elon and, and Grimes son type name. Yeah. And, and so we get, um, Riviera comes out and, uh, he, he has his whole little speech. He's like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, hi, I'm going to perform a show for you. And he dedicates it to three Jane and then he dedicates it to another woman and he glances at Molly and it's like, gee, I wonder who that other woman's going to be. And meanwhile, Case is coming down hard from his, uh, his drug hangover. He can't eat. The wine tastes like iodine. He feels sick. And uh, he's able to play it off with Armitage. It's just something that happens when he travels. And uh, we get we get Riviera's performance. Do you want to take Do you want to take that one? Um, I'd rather not, but I will go ahead anyway. I, I mean, I will if you um, don't want to. <laughs> uh, so so Riviera, he steps up. Imagine the the greasiest, wormiest little garbage man, you garbage person, you know. He he steps up. And out of the weird, disgusting hole in his where where one of his lungs should be, he begins to project a scene. He projects this this room, this this wooden chair, and this sort of like deconstructed holographic woman, um, where where like like you see like the the limbs and the feet and all of these things, and um, over time. As the performance goes on, uh, Case and and we by proxy realize that um, this this uh, this figure is actually Molly, and so you know she she begins to appear, and then her 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 body kind of like is constructed, and then her face, and um, anyway, basically, he begins to simulate having sex with the projection and um and that at that point the this the uh projection version of molly uh begins to extend her blades because she she has those like little finger blades and begins to tear riviera apart so basically your typical kind of like cringe performance art bs it's like Um, it's like gore porn to the extreme it's yeah, yeah, basically just just shock art, um, typical typical performance art trash. Uh, so as this is happening, you know he's case is is um, case is leaving, and then he's kind of, as they 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 kind of um, I don't know he's he runs to vomit and he kind of talks thinks about like he what the the whole point of it is is the idea of. Uh, Riviera creating his dream girl and the dream girl like destroying him that kind of thing yeah. and uh so it's it's pretty pretty uh pretty in pretty poor taste I would say and and uh Case returns and he finds that Molly is left I find it uh very interesting that uh because this was an absolute hit like the crowd was cheering and they were like yeah that was great and this is what ingratiates himself to 3 Jane uh, who's supposed to be a lady of Tessier Ashpool, this really big company, and 
this is something that they're all into. I just find it really funny that it's basically just him being like, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have s imaginary hologram sex on stage. And everyone's like, woo, yeah, this is what we want. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's such a weird, almost dystopic kind of like thing. I, 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 don't, I just, I can't imagine a group of people that would be like, this is what I signed up for. This is what I wanted to see. Well, in the context of like a, a diner, uh, not a diner, what am I saying? In the context of like this a fancy restaurant, you probably wouldn't see it. But things like that do do uh, tend to exist in the uh, in the world of the high art. And like, like as I as I disparage them, like performance art and um, you know a lot of like a lot of art can be like that. It, it can be kind of intentionally provocative. And I think. I think that that's probably uh, that's probably what kind of what happened here. Yeah, and I mean, I know I know there's like the saying that's something along the lines of like all art is sex. And yeah, is that I, a, is that a saying? I feel like I've heard that before. Um, I've heard the phrase "all art is political," but I've not I've not heard that other one. Uh, I, I feel I I hope I'm not making that up. I feel like I've heard that before. Um, or maybe it's all sex is I know it's definitely not all sex is art. I'm pretty sure I've heard people say something like all art is sex. Um, Could be. We, but, neither of us are artists. I only lived with one <laughs> when I was in college. And I, I definitely don't think he was thinking about sex when he painted. No, probably not. <laughs> um, but like, I, and I get that. And there's definitely a lot of um, a lot of pool for art that is a little more on the risque and sexual side. But like the the way that they frame the scene is, it's a pretty highbrow kind of thing, and it's. This, it's it, it's more than just, hey, I'm going to have holographic sex. It's, I'm going to have holographic sex with a woman that is going to tear me apart piece by piece. And it's, I, I don't know, I just, I'm kind of curious as to what kind of people are in this crowd that are, like, getting, uh, getting, uh, he's getting a standing ovation from, from a performance quite like that. Yeah. Uh, it makes you wonder. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm imagining that most people would have that kind of, uh, the producer's reaction to it with the springtime for Hitler. At least the at first their initial reaction to it, not their eventual reaction to it. Yeah, it was it, it it's a weird scene. It was one of my my least favorite uh, scenes as we as we as we've uh, of of the, that we've gone along through. It works very but, well uh, within the confines of the plot, but it's one of those things where you're just like that was interesting. Yeah, like it it establishes you know who Riviera is and establishes the, you know, another aspect of like how, you know, these, the people, the type of people that are on the top of this sort of social hierarchy, you know, the Tessier ash pools of the world. Right. And, um, so it, it does establish things, but it is pretty gross. And if we, I feel, I really feel for Molly who yeah. I'm sure felt very, um, objectified. Very, objectified and dehumanized in that moment yeah and even though it's it all it is is it's his imagination of what she looks like naked because uh um case even states that like the nipples are wrong and i think her breasts are a little misshapen um it's it's not so much the idea of uh like yeah it's his imagination of what molly might look like naked so it's not actually her naked so it's not really her body but still it's the uh, it's it I, I can't imagine that it's any less intrusive or um, uh, dehumanizing to her to see this this man publicly create his uh, fantasy version of her and openly have sex with it in front of a group of people. Like I I man, I, I just I can't even imagine what that feels like. Like what a disgusting piece of shit Riviera is. Yeah, pretty pretty lousy guy. Um, let's see, then, so, so, Case is asking Armitage where, uh, Molly went, and Armitage has no answer for him, so, uh, he talks to, uh, he, he tries to kind of, like, talk to Riviera, like, hey, man, that wasn't cool, why did you do that, and Armitage is just like, just go get some sleep, you know, where we've got the, we've got the job tomorrow, and you have to get ready, um, and uh, that that's 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 basically it. So he Case goes back to his his home hotel room, and he he calls up Malcolm, and he asks him to connect him to uh, 
to to Dixie uh, and and or the flatline device, and uh, so uh, so so he he talks to, to talks to Dixie and he asks him to kind of like to like kind of plug into the uh, to the the system of, of uh, the free town and to kind of help him trace Molly. Um, they he mentions Dix, so Dixie runs that and he he mentions that. She checked into a hotel or under a false name. Um, I think Ro- it was like Rose Kolodny or Kolodny, but she's already checked out. And uh, he's he says that he's gonna go. He's gonna take us some time to check it out. And then there's kind of like this interesting thing where um, it's it's kind of cool. Like he's he's having to wait by the phone. It's just you see how uh, unprofessional. Yeah. Very, very professional. Uh, as it shows, um, so he's he's kind of waiting for for him to call him back. It's very, very old school, very classico style. Um, can't use the internet and be on the phone at the same time. And he's kind of like looking around, and um, he's he's he sees he's watching the wall, and he's he's realizes that he's talking to. That Wintermute is contacting him again, um, and then the, he he realizes that what Wintermute is Wintermute is telling him is like, hey, so just so you know that that uh, having you know running the search for Molly is is tripping all these sort of um, uh, alarms on, in Freeside. He's he's uh, that it's it's causing it's causing uh, too many people to it's causing people to ask some questions, and uh, Wintermute mentions that um you know this kind of behavior is not usual that it exists outside of uh cases um uh behavioral profile which is kind of like this idea playing with this idea of the the the, um the rigidity of ai versus the uh the personhood you know the the ability of a person to grow and change you know that kind of thing and um so basically, he th- this kind of this conversation goes on, and he's it gets to the point where um, Zone, uh, the no, let me say that again, that uh, that Wintermute um, admits that he he is the one that actually killed Linda, or, or essentially, uh, it was his actions that made Linda, you know, that that put Linda in the position that she, where she was actually killed, and. Um, and there's this little, he has this back and forth with Case, you know. And he's he's ask he's acting like you know it's not really that big a deal because after all, you know, she she stole from you, and um, so basically you know it's it's not a really big deal. She she just you know she was just one more pawn and that she basically just had to die. So th- obviously this. And this makes Case quite angry, and so he, he punches the, the display, and kind of Wintermute disappears. Um, that Anyway, that that's that's when uh, he hears back from, from McCoy, who's calling him back, and he, he says that he's he's found where Molly is. And, um, you know, as he's, as he's uh, you know, getting ready to go, he's, he's realizing that, um, He's actually feeling emotions. Um, you know, you you remember emotions, you know, like when like when you're 14. Yeah, I I've heard of them. Uh, it's uh, anyway. So so they uh, they um, he he he's putting together this plan. He's feeling emotions. You know, he's kind of like it's it's kind of like Case himself is kind of awakening. You know. Much like like uh, the AI is kind of the whole mission is for to create this to allow the AI to like un- unshackle itself to um, become its own entity. You know, Case in and of himself is is becoming. You know, fr- he's kind of being awake awoken from this this multi year stupor that he's been in since um, after after he that the job that went bad that um, that that got him. You know. Uh, he so that he could not connect to cyberspace and that he couldn't um, that that you know he, that he's been kind of like 
suppressing himself through through addiction and drugs and that kind of thing. So I don't know. It's it's kind of, there's kind of this interesting sort of um, synchronicity there. So so anyway, he's 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 going to go find Molly, and he he find he finds his his um, I don't want to say his friends necessarily, but the people that he met the other day, uh, Bruce Bruce and Calf, and he basically asks them to uh, to drive him to the location where where uh, the Dixie gave given him. And, uh, they, they, which is, which, so there's a little bit of a back and forth, and, uh, that's event, eventually, he, they, they go with him, and then, but Cap, Cap seems a little bit more eager to go with it, and th- she's like, see, I knew you were a gangster, so she, so, which is kind of interesting, she's kind of like, she's kind of finds, there's like a, a, a thrill to, like, being involved in this sort of, like, um, seedy kind of underworld action yeah, so they they get to the place that um, that she's supposedly at, and it's this this club of sorts, but she's on the lower levels, uh, which is something that's a little more um, specialized. And he goes to the back of the bar, uh, and he's like, "I want to go down downstairs," and he he swipes his credit chip, and he goes down. And uh, he's asked a few questions like, "Hey, uh, what, what do you want, a man or a woman?" And he gets a, a little like, "Okay, go to this room." And so it's basically a, um, it's a, for lack of a better term, we'll just say it's a brothel. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a sex it's a sex shop. Uh, and he goes into his room, like kind of just unconsciously walks to the room that he was given, uh, even though he knows which room Molly is in. And he opens the door, and there's a woman waiting for him. And she's described as being, like, ho- basically hollow and lifeless. And he makes a comment that they're, um, what, what are they called? Like, ch- chippins? A neural cutout. Cutout, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's like a, a, it's a cutout chip. And he leaves her, and he goes to Molly's room. And his chip actually unlocks the door, and she attacks him because she's, you know, she doesn't know what she what to expect, and when she sees it's him, she's like, "Oh, oh shit, sorry." And so we get this. Um, she she's there as she calls it, meditating, uh, waiting for the the job, which is going to commence tomorrow. And uh, she had been getting uh, actually briefed by uh, Wintermute about um, the stray light, and she tells mm-hmm. him that uh, she's basically being motivated by Wintermute. Uh, by getting her to feel hatred towards Riviera, uh, more than she already has, and that's kind of what's driving her for tomorrow. And she tells uh, Case the story of how, uh, when she was younger, she used to work in one of these places, and how they work is they put the uh, the cutout chip in you, and when you are activated, so to say, for a client your body becomes a puppet you're no longer there it's basically like being um is it anesthetized is that that the term that is that i i think that works here uh and uh your body is being used by the client and you have no memory of it you're not conscious for it you're not even like in you're, you're basically not existing in that time it has cut off your consciousness and she was using that to get money to pay for the upgrades that she currently has and her uh, boss learns this so he starts having her become a an even more specialized puppet for some more higher profile people and she mentions that he gives her a slight raise but he's making eight times profit off of what he's paying her for the things that he's having the the the, the kind of specialized work that her uh her clientele is getting out of her out of her body and one one time when she gets one of her upgrades, the um the surgeon uh kind of jimmies the the cutout chip on accident. So she actually comes to consciousness during one of uh, her sessions. And uh, well, I, I should say actually, uh, before that she started she was having dreams, and she was trying to tell herself that they were only dreams, but she understood actually that they were the memories of what was being done to her. Uh, because something was malfunctioning, and so that there was some part of her consciousness that was aware 
while she was working and they were coming back to her in the form of dreams but she was just trying to tell herself that they were dreams and that was kind of her way of coping with it and um so after the the cutoff chip gets damaged she comes to in the middle of a session and there's a senator there and there's a corpse of another woman so he's into some weird sort of like murder play and she freaks out and kills him and that puts a bounty on her from her boss and then that's when she kind of goes on the run and um riviera's performance that night really triggered uh those memories for her and it has really pushed her to want to murder him and case even asks are you gonna kill him and she's like he's gonna die yeah but um yeah we get like man that's quite a quite a harrowing backstory for molly like like, jesus christ yeah it's it's uh yeah pretty harrowing um a lot of interesting things to be gleaned from that backstory in terms of like it just like the the symbolism of you know the the renting renting the body to the to your employer um you know the 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 you know the suppressing the 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 things that that i mean obviously these are heightened examples because her specific um her specific work here is so is of such a traumatic and extreme nature it is like obviously heightened relative to what most people feel but it, there is a lot of it's it's this very interesting um uh the, there's a lot of interesting symbolism here there's a lot of like a meta commentary on you know particularly you know women in the workplace but ju- i think in general like you, you you can feel a lot of um, there's a lot of a commentary on the nature of work and the the sort of like exploitative nature of of society there. Yeah, and it's I mean you know sex work is is no um, it it exists in our world too, and you know there's there's the debate of. Uh, legalizing it which is not something we need to get to here but in this in this world in neuromancer where i i don't there's not really any there's no conversations about whether or not this is some like underground shady business uh that's working under the confines of the law or not but like to see it kind of devolve to this point to where it's i feel like it's even more dehumanizing than some than like a lot of sex work is even now like like now in our world to where it's not the woman like i don't even want to say there's any consent there like there i I mean maybe in the most tenuous legalese contractual fucked up way there is like a very slivery shred of consent but you can't honestly tell me that most of these women are doing this because they want to like this is very much a i i have to for the money kind of thing probably and the way that it just kind of takes their humanity away even more to where they're essentially just fleshy sex dolls and i think he even compares them to dolls at one point he calls them puppets a lot um uh gibson does either through case or through molly um and the the fact that you have this this fleshy meat sack sex puppet that is the that is the real thing but it's this all of the human of it is stripped away to where you're essentially just you just have this the i it's it's disgusting man like that you i I don't i'm gonna say this is worse than the uh than the riviera um performance art yeah, I mean, it is probably worse than the the Rivier performers are because you know, as as you know, disgusting and dehumanizing as that moment was, it was still just a hologram. Whereas these are, you know, living, breathing, thinking, feeling humans that are being exploited in the worst possible way. And you know, like you're saying, that there may be like the an ostensible consent that is being rendered here, like saying like, okay, I am agreeing to work here, and so therefore I am. There is a, 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 they would allege, you know, if you are the people that are running this kind of operation, you would say like that's, you, you know what you're getting into is how they would probably state it. But they, they really, as, as in, in Molly's case, where they, she wakes up and w- wakes up, I'm using air quotes here, and she realizes, you know, just 
the profound horror of this situation that that she's in the senators like obviously she didn't sign up for anything even approximating that so it's just i don't know it's 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 a uh, it's pretty horrific it's it's one of the worst um i don't know just just a total i don't know just just very gross yeah so case leaves her be and he meets back up with bruce and kath outside because they've been very good uh friends waiting for him and he asks to drop uh then to drop him off at the bar so he goes just kind of walking around the bars until morning he's drinking and uh that's when we have his i'm feeling feelings moment and uh so he's sitting there at the bar and kath comes up to him and she's basically just she's just being like you want to get high and have sex and it like almost works he's he's kind of playing along with her trying to like kind of get some information because she she mentions that because her and bruce are dealers they kind of have a they they have they're kind of tapped into the party life and three jane likes to party so they have that kind of uh th- that in with some of the upper echelon of freeside and so yeah she puts she puts some more some more drugs on them and it starts to uh it starts to hit him, and she's like, yeah, let's go get a room. And <laughs> we have this beautiful line, just an, a work of absolute poetry and writing, where his, rea- his, his erection was a bar of lead. <laughs> I don't know. That line stuck out to me, and I just thought it was really funny. Because isn't lead a kind of soft metal? I think it is. Isn't it, like, famously pretty soft and like easy to form yeah like malleable into other thing yeah malleable yeah i i i so I, I thought that line was really funny that kind of i kind of had to stop and laugh at that but then he kind of snaps out of it after kind of looking at her and i think i think he kind of sees a similar kind of deadness in her that he saw in the in like the puppet women at least that's how i that's how i understood it at least so he kind of breaks away and she just you know she's like ah fuck you asshole as he leaves and uh, he just kind of wanders about until finally going back to his room, only to be greeted by the Turing police who have been stalking him this whole time. And the jig is up. You're busted, big boy. We've got Armitage. We've got you. And once you tell us where Kalodny is, we'll have you all. Ha 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 ha. And so Case gets arrested. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Turing police, um, they're very, they're, they were very weird, um, creatures. They were here, um, and then they weren't. And then the story moves on. It, I, I'm well, gonna I love just, it. I just want to, I, I want to hit, hit this real fast, that they're actually old people, but have received treatments, even in excess of what we've seen of Ju- the Julius Dean guy, to look like they were, like, really young. Yeah, and I think I, I think I think we're supposed to. Uh, Case has kind of recognized some like teenagers as he go as he's been going around like the late late teens, like eighteen, nineteen, somewhere in there, maybe early tw- like twenty. Like these kind of people, they've been kind of popping up in the background of all these sequences, and th- that's what he realizes who they are. But they're like actually old. They just receive these treatments to like look younger and younger. And he mentions, like, there's things that you can tell. Like, there's certain, like, aspects of, like, looking in their eyes or, like, specifically their knuckles. I don't know. That, that, was, that was just really creepy. Like, this idea of, um, of, these, of these young people that are actually, like, 80 or something. It was a very strange thought. Yeah, and I, I, I almost wonder, like, uh, I imagine this is going to serve more of a point down the line as we approach the climax of the novel, but as it stands for just this one chapter that they were in, I think it was like chapter 13, it was very much a, it almost felt like a, like just a side, like almost fillery thing where they're just like, aha, we've caught you, and this is what we know, and we've been following you, and you've been a bad boy, and we're gonna take you, and you can come with us, or we'll kill you, and where's Kalodny? Who's Kalodny? Oh, it's the woman that checked into the hotel. I don't know, she's just got doing her own thing. Oh, well, you better tell us where she is. I don't know where she is. Okay, well, we're gonna take you, and we've got Armitage, and ooh, we're gonna get you, we're gonna pin you to the wall, we got all the information, and then they get killed, and then he escapes. Well, 
I think that's that's the thing is is like this idea of like it's supposed to be like okay so if you're if you're into the situation the case is in and you you get the the Turing police which their 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 remit is supposed to be the investigation of AI related crimes and uh, so they're the, they're supposed to you're supposed to see this moment and you see like their modification and you're supposed to intuit in this moment that it's like wow this is like uh, uh, such a this is this is crazy you know you feel like the big the hammer of the law coming down on on them and um, then they they uh, you know they're doing the whole traditional like good cop bad cop they're you know they're talking about they're trying to to, to scare him with the the kind of charges that they're going to give him you know and then they die and they die you know pretty unremarkably um yeah winter mute comes with some sort of machine and cuts them up and yeah a, and, a gardening robot yeah and and case gets away and anyways back to the plot <laughs> and, right but that that just shows you that's that just goes to show like it, it's you know you're supposed to be very a case is anyway supposed to be very afraid in this moment and then you just see the power that you know, even in his restricted form, that Wintermute has. Yeah, and, and like I said, this may this may be setting something up for the climax with the the Turing police and and the kind of trouble that they're in. And it's more it's they have to worry about more than just Wintermute because I think they even say, uh, someone even says that there's going to be more coming. So they they're uh, uh, more Turing police coming really soon. So they're they really need to work fast. Uh, so like they're they're kind of jump starting because I think the job was supposed to be the following night and now it's like in the day and they're like, well, we gotta go. And, uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, this may be something that comes into play later that has just been set up, but as it stands for right now, just in the context of what we've read, it felt really strange to have this big player come in with the Turing police and be like, we've got you now, only to be immediately cut down by Winter Mutant, and it's like, alright, um, anyways, so... Yeah, I, I imagine it'll make a lot more sense later on. I don't want to. I don't want to write it off completely, but I did think it was kind of funny just how how quickly they came and went. And went they did. Yeah. So, and this is this is our our last chapter we're covering today. Um, he makes it to the Garvey and he's jacking in, and the job is a go. And uh, he's talking to he he gets into the flat line, and they're talking, and they activate the Chinese virus, and. Uh, it's just like the job he did before where they got the flat line where he's able to jump back and forth between the matrix and um sim stem thing yeah yeah the sim stem with molly to where he's in he's in molly's perspective but um the second time he tries to jump into molly's perspective he gets pulled into another uh winter winter mute uh construct and they're having um once again another conversation and uh He's, he basically tells him this time he is um, who who is he as this time? Uh, oh, he's Finn. The he, Finn. Yeah, he's the, the Finn. He's the Finn. Um, and he's having a conversation, basically saying, "Hey, um, just letting you know, one of the most important things, the only way this is going to work, is Molly has to get to the core and utter a specific word." as you are breaking the firewall, as you're breaking the ice, and the only way to free me is for that to happen, at, you have to sync up perfectly. And Case is like, alright, what's the word? And he's like, I don't know. I am programmed and hardwired to never know the word, even if you tell me I won't be able to understand it. So that's something you gotta figure out. So, uh, good luck. And he, he mentions that uh, he implanted the wasp nest thing with the TA on it in his dream. And, uh, he encourages him that even though, hey, I know you hate me right now because of the things I've done, but um, it's it's better that you hate TA instead of me because that's going to make this a lot better. And so, yeah, they have their little conversation, and he, he basically just kind of uh, gives him the stakes, so to say, and then just kind of sends him back on his way. And we have... Uh, uh, he, he also mentions that there's... Because uh, earlier he referenced that he's not the only AI that TA has. And he, he's only like one part of a larger of a larger whole. Like he's only one piece of it. And Yeah, he, the one in Rio. Yeah. And he, he, 
he mentions his other I think he refers to it as his other lobe like the brain lobe um, basically be wary of that because that is where like that I think it's like that's going to be where they're going like they're, you're probably going to encounter that you better be careful with that one and he sends him back on his way and we have Case's second case of flatlining and that's where we have ended for this week yeah that's that's um that's that's it uh so leave, leave it on a little bit of a cliffhanger this time yep setting us up for the final act of necroman uh, uh setting us up for the final act of neuromancer at least in the way that we have uh cut this book up and uh yeah i'm excited to see where this goes this is uh such an interesting book i'm really enjoying it yeah I think it's I think it's really interesting. There's a lot going on here, a lot of fun like heist sequences, you know, you know a lot of action. It's I think you know, and and there's there's like some decent like thematic stuff as well. Uh, so thank you everybody for listening. Uh, I've been Dusty, and I'm Daniel, and we'll see you next week for the conclusion of Neuromancer. Have a good one, guys. Take care. <laughs>